Grace, mercy, and peace are yours this day from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, Jesus told a parable. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. But even the disciples didn't get it. So Jesus has to tell them the meaning of the parable. There is a complex theological term for this. It is called a freebie. It should make things easier. The parables contain the secrets to the kingdom of God. Mildly important stuff. Something profound is about to happen. Something otherworldly. Something God in all of his majesty and might and power brought to earth to unlock his kingdom to us. And so we take from it an assessment tool. What kind of soil are you? Take this quiz to find out. But like, not you, because you're here. So obviously you're the good soil. Never mind the fact that Jesus himself couldn't avoid the devil. I must have somehow. It can't be the path. Let's just go ahead and ignore the fact that if the devil wants to assault and target Christians, the one place on Sunday morning he probably spends some time is where all the Christians are. Also, never mind our worries about money and family and politics and politics. Definitely. Don't mention the fact that the cares and riches and pleasures of this life make up more of your prayers than any of the other petitions combined. Y'all cannot be the thorns. Also, never mind if you're not sure which petition I'm talking about. Or couldn't list the Ten Commandments if your life depended on it, let alone keeping them. I'm sure none of us here are the rocks. We are here. So let's just start with the fact that we are the good soil. This is clearly what's wrong with everyone else. And seeing, we do not perceive. Hearing, we do not understand. What the Lord is actually giving us is a list of every single reason that this whole thing should not work. Look at the devil. Look at how many of us have fallen away. Look at our cares. Look at our catechesis. Jesus explains every single reason the church should not still be standing this day. From the martyrdom the apostles, to the catacombs we hid in, to finally coming to power and realizing that we might have ourselves been sinners all along. Look at every last reason the wheels should have fallen off this bus a long time ago. All of the things that all of us wrestle with, the enemies that assault every single Christian this side of glory. But here we are. It defies the condemnation. Of the law. It defies our reason and strength or lack of both because the church does not stand on us. It stands upon Christ and his work. And when we take this parable to be nothing more than an assessment tool, we start looking at ourselves instead of at Jesus and worse. We start looking at each other. Stop looking for yourself. Start looking for Jesus. The whole thing will make more sense because the Bible is not about you. The Bible is about Jesus for you. And if all you have left is an assessment tool, all you have left is law because that's what assessing is. It's measuring something up. An assessment tool is simply a description of yourself and whether or not you are enough to withstand sin, death, and the power of the devil. And since mortality and all, none of us quite measure up. So if your takeaway from this is what you need to do or be, then seeing you do not see, hearing you do not understand, because the law is not how you are going to get into the kingdom of God. The law cannot save you. It can show you how things are supposed to be. It can call you to love your neighbor and love your Lord. It can describe exactly the right path. But by works of the law, no one will be declared righteous. The secrets of the kingdom of God are not revealed by the law, but by the gospel. This is a parable about a sower who sows recklessly, even where no growth at all should happen. It is about a seed that no matter what seems to go wrong, never had anything wrong with it. Did you notice that? The seed always grows every single time. 
There's nothing wrong with the word. This is not just a warning to behave better and care less about the world. It is a promise for sinners who don't, for me and for you. God will not forsake you to the devil. God will not forsake you to your sins or your earthly cares. He visits you even there to preach peace and mercy because he cannot throw the seeds there unless he first goes there himself. The seed is not the word as in a Bible verse, but the very word made flesh. The John chapter 1 celebrated it on Christmas word. The word that was cast into the earth for sinners, for you, for all. The word that was promised to be made a seed that would be born of a woman to save those cast out of the garden where things grew the right way. This is the seed, the word made flesh, the Jesus for you that goes out unto the ones assaulted by the devil, the ones choked by earthly idols, the ones scorched by trial without hope. And he brings truth, peace, forgiveness, mercy. He does not simply search out the good, but all of us all the world, you. He subjects himself to every last thing that the text warns us to run from, to the devil, to the trial, to the temptation. He casts himself into the ground to be buried under everything that overwhelms us. He bears it all so that we might be something more than what to blame when there aren't more believers. He dares to call you good. And so you are. He pours out his own blood into the ground to make you something different. He sheds his blood for you upon that cross to name you something new, something good, something holy. And so you are paid for by him who bore the cross for you. Your sins are forgiven you. He who died is risen. And he delivers to you the gifts of this salvation at that font in your baptism. He washes away what was, every sin that you have ever committed, everything done to you to make you less, every focus you have on the lusts of this world instead of the gift of the God who gives. Every time you have neglected his word, every time the enemy has been just a little bit stronger, you still have the cross of Christ and your sins are forgiven all over again. You are what God makes you to be. You are the baptized. You are the ones washed clean, made new, made good. And the miracle is that it's not actually about what distinguishes you from everyone else. It's because of what he has done for you in love to save you from the devil, from the world, from your own sinful flesh. And what's utterly miraculous is that it works. There is still a holy Christian church because God's word goes forth proclaiming life to the dying. The Christian is called good, and God works in him, for him, and through him. The miracle of Christianity is a God who knows exactly what you are, and he comes down in love to save you, to make you something new, to make you something good. He hasn't stopped. They just call it the church. It's a simple little word to contain a big old miracle. The fruit of the seed the life that comes from Jesus, who descends only to save sinners. But you are saved. You are baptized. You are good. In the name of Jesus, amen. And now may the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, keep your hearts and your minds unto life everlasting. Amen.